This is going to be a study on being perfect. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had said, Be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And this is a concept that has been completely distorted and misrepresented by religion, which has taken the meaning of perfect and turned it into what we most commonly think of when we think of perfect as being something that is without a flaw, without any blemish, um, something that is exactly 100% the ideal, as best as it could ever possibly be. And that's what we think is perfect. And as we know, nothing is perfect, and so what we have is this commandments to be something impossible and to some in religion they think that's what Jesus was doing was telling us to be perfect and knowing that we can't and they characterize that the law was intended to show us that we couldn't keep it and I don't think this is actually correct I think the law came from Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ so I think what he was doing was when he was giving the Sermon on the Mount, he was giving something where he was taking the place of Moses. There's a lot of this that you'll see in the New Testament. If you'll see that there's an Old Testament counterpart to something. So, for example, Moses goes up on a mountain that nobody's supposed to see what he's doing or touch the mountain or come close or draw near and he comes down with a bunch of burdensome stones that are graven images and they have a bunch of rules on them and 3,000 people are killed. So the solution is to solve all the problems by killing those who don't keep the rules. And that's how you're supposed to have your ideal society is whoever doesn't follow these rules, we kill them. So by contrast, Jesus goes up on a mount and there's a whole crowd of people there watching him, listening to him, and he tells them instead of thou shalt not, thou shalt not, he says, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. You have heard it said, but I say to you. So he's overthrowing the law and he's replacing Moses. There's a famous misrepresented passage in that about I have not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. And that does not mean I have not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to keep everything in the law. In fact, he actually made a point of failing to observe the, the law on purpose. Like, for example, touching lepers, which would be a violation of the law, or doing things on the Sabbath in violation of the law. So if your understanding is that Jesus perfectly kept the law of Moses, and therefore that's how you define sinless, Jesus being sinless, You've actually got the wrong definition of sin. You've got the wrong understanding of fulfilling the law. And you're not understanding that when he said, I came not to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill, what he was actually saying is, you guys want to try and accuse me of being anti-Moses and anti-law of Moses. And I'm telling you, I didn't come to destroy the law. Meaning, I didn't just come to be some re rebel against the law of Moses. I came to replace Moses. So he's actually saying it's worse than you think. It's worse than you want to admit. I'm here to replace Moses. And so you'll see in the New Testament all kinds of stories of Jesus replacing Moses. Uh, one of the most notable would be on the Mount of Transfiguration and the Law and the Prophets. You have Elijah and Moses on there and Instead of building three tabernacles, they look up and nobody's left. And God says, here's my son, you know, this is my beloved son, hear him. And so that's a picture of Jesus replacing Moses. Uh, this Sermon on the Mount is a picture of Jesus replacing Moses. They both go up on a mount. They both give a, they both give what is supposedly from God. But one of them is, is burdensome stones that you enforce by murdering people and another is bless is blessings and you've heard it said but I say to you so they're completely in contrast with one another and this is where we are with this 
idea that he said to be perfect. And so religion characterizes that God is some intolerant asshole who is unwilling and, and incapable of enduring anything that is less than flawless, unblemished perfection. And that's not even what he's saying when he says be perfect. Um, so we're going to take a look at that. First, we're going to look at some quotes that I wrote down from some mainstream preachers. And I'm not going to name them because I don't really care to make it about the preacher, but about the words he's saying. And it's a direct quote so that I am not inserting my own bias into it. I'm simply restating what they're stating, and what their position is. I'm not misrepresenting it. This is a quote. I'm not covering up who's saying this or, or anything. I just don't want it to be about who's saying it. I want it to be about what's being said and say it in a way that I'm not putting my own bias into it. So, this one preacher says, um, God is a holy God and a just God, and to stand in the presence of God and to have fellowship with him, you have to have an absolutely perfect record from the moment you are born until the moment you die. You don't have that kind of record, and neither do I. If you died and were judged based on your own merit, you would be found wanting. As a matter of fact, if you took all the best men on the face of the earth and added their virtue together and stood them before God, they would still be found wanting. And so, another quote from another preacher here in something that he said, this is the gospel in a nutshell, and he continued, he said, we are not good. Nobody does good. Nobody's perfect. We all fall short of God's standard. We all justly deserve his temporal and eternal punishment. We live under the wrath of God because he's holy, righteous, and just. And when, oh, so that's all I wanted to quote from that. And so he, in both of these, they are saying that God requires absolute flawlessness, which is impossible. And so God's requirement is something that is not possible to achieve. And so this is apparently what we need to be saved from is God's intolerance towards the thing that he created. His abusiveness and his incoherent rage towards his incompetent ability to produce what it is that he wanted to produce is apparent. I, I mean, if I'm going to take this at face value, what I see is God must be stupid. He must be a moron. I think he's a, he's obviously, you know, not the sharpest knife in the drawer because he can't seem to, as hard as he tries, he just can't seem to get that perfect result that he wants and he's utterly dissatisfied with his creation. Although, the text, that when I go to the Bible, it says that he declared that it was very good. Religion tells you that he looked at creation and said, this really sucks. I can't stand this. Somebody's got to fix this thing. It's supposed to be perfect, and it's not. That's where we stand. So, because of this misunderstanding of what perfect means, or amongst other things, but that's the part we're going to address right now, is this misunderstanding of what perfect means. So here we see it's in Matthew 5, 48, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And that's where this comes from. So first we want to take a look at what the word perfect, its origin is. And its origin, you know, words don't necessarily mean what they originally meant. They do transform over time. They're, they're, what they mean is contingent on their usage, which is why you always need to look at the context of a word to find out what it really means in context, because the usage of the word is what it means. But let's look at what it originally meant in the first place so that we can have a better understanding of what's being said here when it says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. So, not that much before the time at which the King James was written, we have this word coming into being from an old French. And what it actually means, it, is, it means to be completed. And if you look at the Greek, 
and I'm no Greek scholar, but I can see that the word that is translated as perfect is related to the same word that is used when Jesus said, it is finished. So, it is talking about be a state of completion. The word perfect comes from the the prefix means completely, and then it means and then the word facer, which means to make or do, which is where we get it's the same root as the word fashion. So to fashion something, to make something. So it is to make something complete. Perfect actually meant to make something complete, and you see in the verb form of it, it says to bring to full development. So when Jesus says to be perfect, he's saying to be complete. Now we can go to the book of James, and we can actually see this backed up, and I'm not on the right tab here. We can go to the book of James, and we can see that the book of James says what I just said. Because... It says here in James chapter 1, verse 4, it says, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So, this is not perfect and then a completely unrelated attribute we're going to call entire, and then some other concept that's vaguely unrelated called wanting nothing. No, these are all supporting each other. Be perfect and entire, wanting nothing is defining be perfect. So when Jesus says be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, he's not saying be without flaw, be without blemish, live a life that you've never made a mistake ever. You've never gotten anything wrong. Your doctrine couldn't be it's I mean, if if you aren't the expert then nobody is. That's not what it means. It means to be entire, wanting nothing. So there it is in the book of James. Be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's supported by the root of the word, which is to be made complete. Um, so now we go and we take a look in Matthew 5. And we note in verse 48, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Well, there's this word here and there's a neat little rule clever you know or maybe not be therefore perfect so when you see a therefore you want to go back and find out what it's there for so this is actually in in the middle of this is the meat in a sandwich actually and this is something that is used a lot in the sermon on the mount and it's probably going to be kind of the foundation of some other things I want to look at in the Sermon on the Mount at a future time. This sandwich structure, I'm going to call it, where there's the very center of the idea surrounded by other things that go on. Um, and so you'll see this structure happen bef happen in other places in the sermon where he'll be talking about something and that there will be an illustration in the middle and he'll go back to talking about the thing or that there will be a parable and then kind of like an explanation and then a parable on the other side. At any rate, there's these sandwiches that get made. Now this be therefore perfect, therefore tells you to go backwards and find out what it's talking about, but it actually continues, the same premise continues into chapter 6 and this verse here is the meat in the middle of a sandwich. So if you want to go back and find out what the therefore is there for, you're going to find out that he's giving a bunch of illustrations that have to do with not wanting something in return. To not be seeking. So the law mentality says that you do in order to get. So law, law is a principle where your behavior is coerced by virtue of a threat of punishment or a promise of reward for doing the things that you're supposed to do and not doing the things you're supposed to not do. So you're driven by this promise of reward and the threat of punishment, and that's the coercion that modifies your behavior. You want to receive that reward. You want to avoid that punishment. You do in order to get. And so this is attacking the do-to-get mentality by saying, do, but don't ask anything in return. Your, your goal is not 
to do in order to receive <clears throat> to receive a reward you're doing because you're being driven by love for one another and that's an inspiration that's the rivers of living waters you get carried away in the current and it just takes you along with it the sloppy agape just splashes all over everything and the the rivers of living water sweep everything out of the out of the pathway and just carry it all along and it's unstoppable it's you can't block it you can't get in the way you can't go upstream and that's the mentality to go by is that you're blessed in your deed which is going to get back into the book of James that what you do you don't do in order for a promise of reward you do it because the act itself is the blessing so if i help someone with some with say they're grieving and i and i try to make them feel comforted and and bring them out of that grief a little bit that that very interaction itself is the reward as opposed to i'm doing that and then thinking you know okay well because of this what goes around comes around you know it's going to be paid back to me that's a law mentality of saying that i'm doing this in order to get a reward so when jesus sandwiches this be therefore perfect in the middle of this sets of illustrations here he's saying he's he's attacking the mentality of doing something in order to get something in return and so on this side of it the the chapter 5 side of it he's kind of looking at at one way of it and then when we get to the other side of the sandwich he'll be looking at the other way of it so this is the side saying do these things without looking for your reward and then when you get to chapter 6 it says don't do these things to get the reward like the hypocrites do so it kind of looks at it two different ways a little bit but within the middle is this don't be doing things in order to get a reward that's what he's saying be therefore perfect as your father in heaven is perfect which is to be complete and entire wanting nothing and so that's what he's that's what's going on here so if we start in yes let's start in chapter 5 verse 38 it says you have heard it has been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth well that's that's retributive justice that's balance out that's you what goes around comes around everything equals out <clears throat> and he says but i say to you that you resist not evil but whosoever shall smite you on the right cheek turn to him the other also and if any man will sue you at law take away and take away your coat let him have your cloak also and whosoever shall compel you to go a mile go with him too give to him that asks you and from him that you would borrow who would borrow of you turn not away so all these things he's telling you to do these things and you're not going to get any you're not going to get a return in fact not only don't expect a return just go along with it go with the flow and now i know there's some teachings that'll say like turn the other cheek is a way of of being it's a it's a way of being defiant you know the the person has to strike you another time or that there's a law saying that when they compel you to go a mile carrying their gear they're not allowed to let you go more than a mile that's possibly part of the interpretation uh, I don't dispute that but one thing that's clear is that he's not he's he's not s insisting that you would that you're going to get something in return on these he doesn't say turn the other cheek and you know you're gonna be rewarded for that but we get to that in chapter 6 on the other side and it says uh, in verse 43 you have heard it has been said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy but I say to you love your enemies bless them that curse you do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be children of your father which is in heaven for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust for if you love them which love you what reward have you do not the publicans even the same and if you salute your brethren only what do you more than others do not even the publicans so be therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect the father in heaven is not seeking a reward for what he does he's not seeking a return on what he does he's not putting his reign on the 
just and on the unjust and making his son to rise on the evil and on the good in order to get something in return. He's not looking for a reward. If you love them which, which love you, what reward have ye? Well, religion tells you that God loves you in order to get a reward. He's, you know, that, or, or even worse than that, that he loves you based on how much you love him. If you love God, then he'll return the favor. But this is saying, if you only love those which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. Let's apply that to God. If he only loves those who love him, how's he any better than the publicans? Then God's God's not even superior to mankind then. Um, so, when he says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, he's not saying, be without flaws, be without making any mistakes, be without ever getting anything wrong, be without ever having a misunderstanding, be without ever having a disability, be without... That's not what it's saying about being perfect. It's not saying to be this model of an ideal. It's saying not to want anything in return. So the goal is to be as the Father in heaven, not expecting anything in return for what you do, but just be doing it because you feel moved to do it because that's what love motivates you to do. Love for one another motivates you to behave in this way, and that's your sole purpose for doing it. You're not looking for anything in return. Now we get to chapter 6. It says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. So he's contrasting giving charitably for the purpose of being seen versus giving charitably because it helps the people that are in need. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. And this actually reminds me of the sheep and the goats where he's saying, you know, you gave the cup of water and they say, you know, when did we do that? We, we never saw you. And he says, Whoever you, whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me. That's also attacking this same message of of doing in order to get your reward. The, the one group did because it was in their hearts to do. The other group didn't do because they weren't being seen in order to do it. And if they, their presentation is that, hey, if we, if we knew you were watching, we would have been doing these things. And so one group is motivated by what they feel inspired to do. The other is motivated by a do to get seek your reward mentality. And so it says that's not the that's not the mentality to be having. So I don't want to get into that particular parable at the moment. But that's what is going on the same principle of saying, are you doing this to be seen? Are you doing this for your reward? Are you doing this out of the kindness of your heart? Are you doing this because somebody else is going to benefit from from that? You know, are you doing this because that other person is made in the likeness and image of God as well, and that other person is the pearl of great price as well? Or are you doing this because you think there's something you're going to get out of it? So he says, take no heed that you do, or take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when you do your alms, don't sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. What's their reward? They have the glory of men. That's what their reward is. They're doing it so they can be seen and they can boast. And I might get sidetracked here a little. Hypocrites. Okay, hypocrites doesn't mean don't do as I do. Okay, hypocrites, if you read this, you'll see what hypocrites is. Hypocrite is a person that performs their religious rituals in order to be seen and to be praised for performing their religious rituals. But they're not actually doing anything out of a feeling of kindness. They're not doing anything out of a heart of compassion. They're doing what they're doing in order to be seen. There's the one speech where he says, you know, woe to you hypocrites. And one of the things that always stands out to me is they give their religious tithe instead of giving their money to the needy. So that's what hip, that's what hypocrite is. Hypocrite is is the kind of person that would give their religious tithe at the at the altar rather than give to the needy. So 
I'll just leave that at that. I don't want to get sidetracked with that. Okay, so in verse 3 it says, When you do your alms, let your, not your left hand know what the right hand does. That your alms may be in secret, and your Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. But even still, the, a lot of people are going to take this and say, still see it as being a do in order to get rewarded mentality. But the idea is that this is to be doing this not for a reward. He's saying that there's there's a principle at play. And that is that if you do unto others as you would have them do unto you, it kind of generally often does work out that things go in your favor. So that's really the way to look at this as far as that your father which sees in secret shall reward you openly, as opposed to actually, if you're still holding on to this idea that you're going to be rewarded for what you're doing, you're still in the wrong mentality. You're still not being perfect as the Father in Heaven is perfect because you're still doing it in order to get a reward. So if what you're seeing in this is the idea of do this in order to get a reward from God instead of do this in order to get a reward from men, you're still seeing it wrong. The idea is not to be doing it for a reward, but that there probably will be a reward. It's kind of like it, it probably will work out that way, but that's not why you should be doing it is is where it's kind of getting at. And so it says, And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They're performing their religious ritual in order to be seen. That's their reward. But when you pray, enter your closet, and when you have shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So, Again, don't get caught on this idea of the Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The point is not to be doing this for a reward, but to be doing it because it's it's what you feel the heart of compassion, it's what you feel the heart of love moving you to do. It's what the river of living water flowing out of your belly is causing you to do. That you're being led by the Spirit, you're not walking in the flesh, which means walking in the do-to-get mentality. It means walking according to the law, walking according to re religious rituals and traditions of men. And so, then it gets into this part here, and we're going to skip a little. And so we're going to skip down to verse 16. It says, when you fat, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces. Which is, it's saying... They make a public spectacle out of their fasting. So it's, you know, they, they want to make sure that you know that they're fasting. And it says not to do it that way. So when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Be thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in the secret, which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And then it says, Lay not up yourselves for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so, again, the, the premise here is not to be operating, and I've seen plenty of arguments about heavenly rewards. You know, you're going to die, and one person is going to get the, the better neighborhood to live in because they did more religious works. That's not correctly understanding the Father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. That's that's a completely just missed the point on the whole thing. It's just saying that it's trying to, to bring forth the idea that you're not just going to be on the losing end of the deal all the time. By giving, a, by giving to others out of the goodness of your heart and giving to others because they are in need and you have the means to, to satisfy that need. It's just trying to present the idea that you're not on the losing end. You're not the doormat. You're not just constantly giving, 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 and, and 
you're just being sucked dry. The idea is to 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 counter the idea that this is just a vampiric thing to do that now instead of doing things in order to be seen of men now you're just you're just losing out all the time you're just a doormat so that's what this whole bit about the father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly is just trying to challenge that idea that this is some kind of way of just l losing everything that you have to everybody else and they're just taking advantage of you it's trying to say that there's a principle at work behind everything that you do that's going to balance things out and you know if you're going to be kind to others you'll receive kindness in return i can think of somebody that i know personally that's always looking out for other people and whenever she gets into a tight situation i can't even believe the number of people that she has that are always there to be able to 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 help her get through that because it just it does come back it does return itself to a pretty good amount it doesn't not to the extent that there's never a problem but to the extent that the support structure is always there so that's what it's trying to say is you're not going to just be a doormat this is not saying let's let's set aside being rewarded by people in order to be rewarded by God. It's the principle is still to give of your heart of compassion, to give of your love for one another, to give because it is needed, to give because giving is is where the the river of living water is flowing out of you and inspiring you and just moving you to do this. And it's it's just trying to emphasize that you're not going to be this vampirized doormat by doing this. So that's really the point of those passages. It's not to say that you're going to get the better neighborhood when you die and go to heaven. That's completely corrupt from the point and has completely, so completely missed the point that it's ridiculous. Because um, the idea is, is to not be moved by a do-to-get mentality, to not be doing something for the reward that you're going to get, but to be doing it because, you know, if somebody is in need, you want to help that person because you care. So you should be blessed in the deed itself. You should be doing it because it's just it just feels good to do it. That should be what you're getting moved to do. That's what Jesus is saying in terms of being perfect as your Father in Heaven is perfect. God does not bring the rain and the sun in order to get rewarded. Even though religious religion will actually tell you He does. <laughs> like, you know, you had better get on your feet and praise Him. I, you know, how dare you sit... I've heard this. How dare you sit down on God? How dare you sit down on the Lord? Like, you know, well... He doesn't need me to stand up and dance and throw my arms in the air. You know, I want to meditate on something. I'm thinking about something. Who are you to tell me how I can praise God? Uh, I'm going to get sidetracked again. <laughs> um, yeah, God doesn't do these things in order to be in order to be praised. He does think he does what he does because of his love for the creation that he has made. He does it because that's he he loves what he's made. He declared it very good. He's never turned his back on that. He's never changed his mind about that. And so to be perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect is not to be without flaws. It is not to be without errors. It's not to be without mistakes. It's to do things not seeking a reward in return. Um, and so that's... The, that's what perfect actually means. And I want to see down in James again that it says in verse 22, no, verse, uh, verse 25 rather, it says, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, not he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, that man's religion is in vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God is the the Father is to do this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep unspotted from the world. 
And that doesn't mean don't drink and don't ever... I don't want to get sidetracked. <laughs> um, yeah, so the law of liberty is what is the perfect law of liberty. <laughs> I mean, not the perfect law of Moses, not the perfect law of the Ten Commandments, not the perfect law of we have a New Testament law that Jesus gave a bunch of rules like cut off your limbs. No, the perfect law of liberty. And liberty is a river of rushing water. Liberty is an overflow. Liberty is that current that you get carried away in and you just can't help it. Liberty is free flowing. So if you look in the perfect law of free flowing and continue therein, then you're blessed in the deed. It means that when you come across somebody in need, somebody who's grieving, somebody who you can help somehow, and the free flow just flows freely, then that in itself is the blessing. That is what being perfect is. Being perfect is wanting nothing in return. You're not doing it for a reward. It's not due to get. And so we finish by looking in 1 John chapter 4 that what God's is, God has perfect love. And again, perfect meaning wanting nothing in return. And so perfect love is the God type of love. That's the agape love, is perfect love. It is love that wants nothing in return. And that blows up religion right there, that God somehow is testing us to find out if we love him in return. That's false. That's wrong. God is not... We, we don't live the life that we're living here right now for God to find out if we love him in return. That's wrong. That's completely incorrect and just, it's not even worthy of discussion, really. It's just blatantly wrong. And so, it says, in verse First John 4, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. So here it is. The love is perfected. It is made complete. Not, not that it is made without flaw. Although, in this particular context, that's not horribly wrong, at least. But his love is made complete in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect. So perfect being complete. Our love is made complete. How? That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So, to know... And believe the love that God has to us. And to know that God is love. That is what makes our love perfect. Our love is made complete. By understanding the complete kind of love that God has towards us. That he's not expecting something in return. He's not doing what he's doing in order to earn our praise. Or receive a reward on. You know. I guess he's maybe a little insecure. And he wants to be validated. Find out that, that we love him back. Uh, I don't know, just, there's so much about religion that makes me think, like, what kind of moron do you think God is? Like, is he just an idiot? Is he insecure? Is he just intolerant? I really don't understand the kind of view that religion presents. Of it's That's why people re reject Christianity, because it's insane. They have a God who's a dim-witted, moronic, intolerant, abusive, incoherent, angry, insecure, dullard. And that's what you get from religion. And that's absolutely not what you get from the New Testament. It's It doesn't match up. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So, according to this, it doesn't say anything about being afraid of the day of judgment. It says to have boldness in the day of judgment. Personally, I think the judgment was forgiveness. So I think 
we have boldness in the day of forgiveness is a good way to read that. If there, uh, verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. And so, again, perfect means to be complete. There's no fear in love, but love that is complete. Love that wants nothing in return. Think about that again. This whole thing has been about not doing in order to get. Love that gives for the sake of giving casts out fear. Love that gives for the sake of receiving might make you a little afraid. You might think, did I give back enough? But love that gives with wanting nothing in return casts out fear. And if you have fear, then you haven't been made complete in love. So it's, it's flipping it over both ways. Love that wants nothing in return casts out fear. And if you have fear, then you haven't been made complete yet. You haven't been made complete in your understanding of love. You don't understand the love that God has towards us. You don't understand that God is love. We love him because he first loved us. Not we love him and he figures out how much he loves us based on how much we return that love. It's perfect love. It's love that wants nothing in return. It's love that is fulfilled by the giving of it. It's love that has contained within it the reward. It's love that has within it being blessed in the deed. That's what perfect is. That's what perfect love is.